In 2012, Camperini's memoir, Caveat Emptor, was published by Pegasus Press. This landmark book that caused a storm of controversy in the art world in New York and London chronicles his career as a master painter and art forger that spanned over 30 years. Camperini is still producing what he describes as the most deceptive fakes in the world. This is the first in a series of shows. Ken will begin by addressing the most frequently asked questions since the publication of Caveat Emptor. In future shows, Ken will give demonstrations of how he creates his masterful paintings and share many secret techniques he developed over the years as an art forger. Ken will also share his views on many topics, including the history of European and American painting, and give surprising insights on his favorite painters. Now, here is Ken Perini. Ken, you have always said that you feel a kinship with the artists you emulate. Can you expand on that? Sure. Uh, you know, since my book came out, I, I, I have heard from people, not only from all over the world, but all over the country, that thanked me for uh, enlightening them to, to the rich history America has in art. Uh, most people have probably heard from, you know, heard of uh, Sargent or uh, Frederick Church or some of these great American painters, but most people have never heard of Martin Johnson Heed or James E. Buttersworth or William Aiken Walker or the Peel family uh, and, until they read my book. You know, I, I had a um, really a great compliment. One of the one of the leading scholars today in uh, 19th century American paintings contacted me and uh, and uh, I was greatly flattered. He said that uh, my book served a great purpose in bringing awareness uh, to so many people about artists that have been practically forgotten about except for an elite group of collectors and dealers in, in, in the northeast part of our country. So uh, I, like for instance, here is a really fine little Buttersworth. Now this is um, one of my own composition and Buttersworth liked to um, situate his, his, his yachts and in this case a pair of sloops in a race in Lower New York uh, or New York Harbor, and this is Castle Gardens, a pavilion uh, that was where about like where Battery Park would be today, and this is Governor's Island with the fort on it, and the Staten Island Ferry goes right across here. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid in the summer, sometime my friends and I we would go down to Battery Park get on the, the, the ferry just to take the ride back and forth, just to get out and feel the, you know, the, the air and, and look at the water and everything. And I remember seeing this fort when, when I was a kid and wondering about it. And, and the, the foundation of Castle Gardens is still in Battery Park today. And we used to uh, explore it and walk around it and wonder what it, what it is. So I grew up, and, and, and Buttersworth, in fact, uh, lived in, um, West Hoboken, New Jersey, right next door to Hoboken, where I was born. And uh, so I always felt sort of like um, a natural, uh, you know, connection with, 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 with Buttersworth um, since, since Jimmy Rico introduced me uh, to the artist. And then, for instance, like uh, uh, Martin Johnson Heed, one of, one of my uh, favorite painters and who I uh, have spent 30 years uh, understanding how he paints, how he creates a painting, how he balances everything out here, uh, the, the flower, the birds, the mountains. This example here, one of my own composition, I believe he himself would shake my hand if he saw this and happily put his name on it. Uh, these are very beautiful paintings, and you know, Heed 
actually painted some of his haystack paintings within walking distance of where I grew up in New Jersey, down on the meadows there. So these were painters that uh, I felt uh, uh, a close attachment to. Uh, I think that, you know, I, 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 I'm a person that feels that art should belong to everybody. Uh, I, I feel sorry for people that uh, have always wanted to own a Buttersworth, a Walker, a Heed, uh, and just can't afford them. The prices are astronomical today. So that's partly why I want to do this series, so I could um, share my techniques with people so that uh, almost anybody could, could, could own a, a Heed or a Buttersworth. I want to show the steps and demonstrate the steps on how to create these, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, fakes, and uh, and uh, I think anybody with a with a, a minimal amount of artistic uh, ability could, uh, with my guidance, uh, create. A, I cannot really give classes myself. Uh, many people have uh, contacted me and want to know: do, do I give workshops and and so on? And no, I, I'm just so busy uh, flooding the market with fakes myself these days that I, um, I really can't um, do that. So that's why as a public service, I want to uh, share the techniques that I've developed over 30 years with uh, others so that they too can uh, create uh, some of the most de de deceptive fakes in the world. Ken, it's often been uh, commented that you have amazing versatility. How do you account for that? Well, uh, I would say uh, you have to always stay one step ahead of the experts and the marketplace. Um, survival in this business depends on change. One has to constantly keep moving into other areas of art. And sometimes this is caused by uh, necessity and events. For instance, in 19... <laughs> in 19... It was around 1980, um, my good friend, uh, Tony, who I write about in the book, uh, and I were flooding the market with, with fakes, American paintings, and uh, we had a very close uh, brush with the law at that time. <laughs> it's embarrassing, really. We, we didn't have the experience to understand um, that too many paintings showing up in too short of a time and too small of an area would be bound to raise some eyebrows. And after flooding the New York market with fake butters, words, teens, and walkers, we had the FBI looking into our activities, and um, that uh, was a, uh, a cause of great concern at that time, and I, I write about that in my book. So I had to, um, after things blew over, I eventually um, went to England. And when I was in England, I adapted myself to uh, the British way of painting. So uh, I would say that uh, you have to constantly keep changing and exploring new areas of art and challenging yourself to uh, adapt to uh, a different school and technique of painting. Now, one of the painters that I so uh, admired was uh, was this man here, John Herring. Now, I would say that. This is probably one of the last painters that a forger would want to specialize in because his technique is very, very difficult. And if you 
come in close on this, you could see the detail that is required in the jockey and the, the horse and, and the reins on, 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 on it, uh, on, the, on the horse, are all very finely painted. Now, Herring, okay, Herring had a lot of copyists in the, in the period. Uh, and there, I've never seen any good ones myself. You could spot them a mile away. And I sought to always um, meet or exceed the quality uh, that Her Herring incorporated in his, in his paintings. I always say that a great Herring is like a piece of crystal. It's clean, it's crisp, it's often very light, and it's, it just is absolutely a, uh, a beautiful example of, of 19th century equestrian painting. So in, in the uh, 1980s, uh, because of events that took place in New York City, and uh, my great friend Tony, being uh, interviewed on repeated occasions by the FBI in regard to uh, our activities in the art world, I was required to go to England and find myself artistically in a completely different way. So I had to adapt the, uh, the, 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 the skill that I uh, that I perfected in the American school to a different way of thinking. Another artist that I liked very much was James Seymour. And I sold a lot of these through the years. Um, and these artists also had a, um, a commonality with many of the American painter painting painters and that was that they um, they made a lot of uh, variations and copies of their own work so again if I studied their work and bought a lot of research material and and um, uh, and put together flowcharts, visual flowcharts of their work, I could discern patterns that I, can, I could exploit and place a, uh, another creation logically within that series. So it takes a lot of thought, a lot of uh, understanding, and I have to say that I truly loved the equestrian painters of the 18th and 19th century in Britain. So this became another specialty of mine that, uh, that, I, uh, that I worked on for years, created dozens and dozens of these paintings, and every now and then one shows up here and there in a catalog or a magazine, and, and it's uh, very satisfying to, to, uh, to see that. Uh, a, a great fake has to also stand up to the test of time. Uh, I think second-rate fakes, uh, the more they're studied, the more they'll show their deficiencies. So it is up to the astute forger to be critical of his own work, to live with it for a while, perhaps, and look at it carefully and see whether it um, it uh, stands up to the scrutiny of his own judgment and therefore then hopefully the scrutiny of the experts.